So the purpose of this video, inshallah, is that I'm going to be reacting to the clips that you've sent me on uh, Telegram on the link that you would see on the screen or you see in the description box if you go to the description box people can send clips inshallah and we'll be reacting to these clips it's only going to be clips and videos so these are the only things that are going to be viewed and the only things that we will be reacting to inshallah yeah i believe in islam but okay. i have a lot of respect for jesus christ peace be upon him so you'll hear from some muslims they'll say oh but the bible's been corrupted or changed but that's not actually the case at all well, you don't have to hear from Muslims saying the Bible has been corrupted or changed. Even Christians will tell you that. Christian textual criticism scholars will tell you that. People who even left Christianity because of it will tell you that. You look at Bart Ehrman, for example, and his book Misquoting Jesus, for example, or other books that he's written or other videos that he has on this issue, where he left Christianity. And he will tell you that, that the Bible has been changed. Even some conservative scholars who passed away, for example, very recently, like Bruce Misker, who has a book called text of the New Testament is uh, transmission, corruption and restoration, where he talks about corruption, where he talks about, it's a fact. Even when you talk about the Bible, which Bible are you talking about? It's not Muslims say. You tell us which Bible you follow, 66, 73, 80, 83, 82, 88, which, 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 which one are you following to begin with? The number of texts that you have is there, the number of the canon, what people, what some people consider the word of God and what other people, certain books that they consider the word of God, certain literature and text, is not found in others. These are not translations because a lot of people say these translations. No, no, no. We're not talking about translations. We're talking about the number of the chapters, the number of the uh, books. There are extra books in the 73. There's extra books in the 83 for the Orthodox. There's extra books for the Ethiopian Orthodox. Now, which Bible are you talking about first that Muslims say change or not? The Bible itself is a fact. It's evidence that it is changed. There's still only one Bible. It's in the Hebrew and the Greek. It's been translated to English. But because it's still Okay, and that's an, an interesting point here. It says there's only one Bible in the Hebrew and the Greek. That is completely false. Because when you look at the Hebrew, for example, what do you have in the Hebrew? You have multiple, different manuscripts. The earliest you have in the, is the Dead Sea Scrolls, which does not cont contain the full Old Testament. It just contains the majority of, the, of Isaiah and parts of the other Old Testament. And the Hebrew of it is different anyways. And, and, and then you have other uh, very late the Septuagint and this and that. You have very other manuscripts of different things. Right, so it's not one. There's not one agreed upon Hebrew text. And when you look at, at the at the at the Greek, you say one Greek. Which Greek? The Codex Sinaiticus or the Vaticanus or or the thousands of other manuscripts that contradict each other. Like he is pretending as if like it's one text in the Greek and, and the Hebrew. That's not the case. If you go to the original manuscripts that they use for the Bible that you read, these are different manuscripts and they contradict one another. And and they are evidences by themselves that this text has been changed. But what is even more important than that? Is evidence that is corrupted is that Greek was not uh, is that Jesus was not speaking Greek. He was not going around speaking Greek to the people. <laughs> so when you say the Greek, the, the, this is not what, what Jesus was speaking about when he was going around. So that's evidence that is corrupt because this is a translation of a translation of a translation. So uh, you don't have anything original to try to pretend as if this is not the case. In the Hebrew and the Greek, it hasn't been changed or corrupted. We've got thousands of manuscript copies that we've discovered that showed that it hasn't changed at all. The only thing in the manuscript showed is that they, disagree, they, they contradict one another. And you can look at Bart Ehrman's, uh, uh, where he said, he literally stated that the number of discrepancies and disagreements between is more than the words of the Bible. You know, when he looked at these manuscripts, between the manuscripts, is more than the words in the Bible. There are more discrepancies and contradictions and, and problems and corruption. So that is like just outright uh, nonsense. Even the Quran itself says that Allah gave us the Torah and the, the gospel. Right. No, Allah doesn't say he gave you the Torah and the gospel. That's a lie. Allah says he gave Moses, Musa, the Torah and gave Jesus the, the Injil. Allah says, وَآتَيْنَاهُ الْإِنجيل, And we gave him the, the gospel. And what you have is not well, that which was given to Jesus. What you have is not that which is given to Moses. You have what Mark and Matthew and Luke and John wrote, which is a complete different story. And, and the gospel, yeah, that's correct. That's, that's... But this person that he's talking to, he seems, I don't know, he seems fake for me. He's, he seems as if, I'm not going to make any accusations, but this Muslim that he seems is talking to, he's just nodding his head. And, uh, his behavior seems a bit abnormal. Like there's a bit of fakeness into this, this clip. I don't know what this clip is, but it does seem like it. But anyways, we'll we're, we're rebut the arguments anyways, whether this is a, a real person or not, or just someone pretending. It doesn't matter. It's written in the Surah Al-Baqarah. Yeah, that's right. correct. Yeah, and it talks about how yeah. uh, Allah's words will never change. Yeah, well, I know, Injil is not in Surah Al-Baqarah, but okay, let's listen. Which means then if Allah... 
Okay, now now he uses he uses a verse of the Quran which says none none of the words of Allah Azza wa can change. And this is referring to the Quran. How do you know? Just read the full verse. Recite what has been revealed to you from the book of your Lord. What was book, which book was revealed to Prophet Muhammad The Quran. <laughs> so this verse that he's using, no one can change his words, is referring to the Quran specifically. It's not referring to other scriptures in the past, which the Quran explicitly mentioned that they have been changed, like in chapter 2, verse 75, and chapter 2, verse 79, for example. So it's just deception happening here, but let's watch. Gave these books, the Torah and the Gospel, then that would mean those books don't change. That's correct. And very good point. Yeah. I never. <laughs> this person was just agreed with him, you know? But, anyways. I never really looked at it with that viewpoint. 100%. Yeah, very good point. It was interesting in the Quran, it also mentions in Surah 5, yeah, please. 47, it says, So let the people of the Gospel judge by what Allah has revealed in it. And those who do not judge by what Allah has revealed are truly the rebellious. So notice that the people of the gospel, so Christians, we should be judging by what God has revealed in the gospel. Now look, uh, another misrepresentation, right? Okay, open chapter uh, 5 of the Quran. And then start from verse 43 onwards. Then where Allah Azza explicitly, he mentions the first gradually. He's talking about the gradual history of things. Starts first by, by Moses. Saying that uh, Allah Azza wa Jal gave وَأَنزَلْنَا uh, التَّوْرَةَ فِيهَا هُدَى وَنُورَ And we send down the Torah in it, guidance and light. And then Allah mentions that same verse that, that He gave the preservation of the Torah to the rabbis and the priests which then corrupted, corrupted it later. Uh, and then later on, so Allah is talking about and then He says let the people judge right, with the Torah. Meaning the people at the time of Moses that Allah have sent them this Torah as a guidance and light judge with the Torah. And then gradually Allah moves history forward towards who? Jesus, and then he says, and then we sent Jesus. We sent after them Jesus, and then we give Jesus the, the gospel. And then let the people at the time of Jesus, which is the verse he's quoting, judge with the gospel. But then what's interesting is he's not reading the next verse. Because the next verse refutes everything he says. And then Allah says, and then we send down to you the book, i.e. the Quran. And then Allah says that judge between them, Allah says then, then the Quran is a criterion over these previous scriptures. So whatever the, agrees with the Quran is with that which is to be taken. The literal next verse that he's avoiding. And then the next verse also says, So judge between them with that which Allah has revealed to you. Meaning judge between the Christians and the Jews with the Quran. It's not just saying judge between them with, with the gospel. This is for the people of the time of Jesus. It's not saying judge between them with the Torah. This is for the people of the time of Moses. But when you take things out of context to try to make an argument, it's sad, honestly. But let's see. Which would mean that but, it mustn't have been corrupted or anything by the time that Quran was written in 600 AD and we've actually got manuscripts of the gospel of the Bible from way before 600 AD still in our possession today yeah the earliest you have is, is 400 years after Jesus like which is 200 years before the prophet Isaac. not way before it's like literally 200 years I'm 400 years separate from Jesus that is the full uh, Bible that you have the full manuscript that you have of the New Testament the Codex Sinaitic and so therefore if it wasn't corrupted no. in that time then it mustn't be corrupted at all I'm yeah. I need to honestly how this other person is reacting is, is funny but I need to take a picture of this verse if you don't mind like, yeah different that's a very different. interesting yeah. verse that's a very interesting verse wow, wow, wow let's just say maybe he was not prepared you know I noted everything down my Good. friend oh no nice. yeah. he's saying I noted everything down and all he has in the notes is Mark Matthew Luke and John <laughs> it's okay all right yes <laughs> yeah that's good I actually I like that I actually yeah. wanted someone to tell me to read the specific kind yes. of verses that you mentioned. Yeah. So I'll definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. One other, yeah. I think only thing one other one that might be helpful is this one in verse 68 of Surah 5. It says, Say, O prophet, O people of the book, you have nothing to stand on unless you observe the Torah, the gospel, and what has been revealed to you from your Lord. Okay, wow. why don't we follow this? <laughs> It's absolutely clear, okay? So, so read it again. O people of the scripture, لستم على شيء. You are upon, you are upon nothing. حتى تقيم until you establish the Torah and the Injil and the Gospel and that which was revealed to you from your Lord, which you are conveniently ignoring. What is the, la the last thing other than the Torah and the Gospel that was revealed to you from your Lord? The Quran. So this verse is essentially, if you take it, it is super clear. Yes, follow the Quran. <laughs> you are upon nothing until you establish the Torah and the Gospel and the Quran. And through establishing the Qur'an, then you will establish the, the correct parts from the Torah and the Gospel. 
and you'll move away from the parts that has been changed. But you conveniently are ignoring, you're, you're ignoring that last part, but yeah. It's so clear, isn't it? So basically, yeah, that, that, that worst means that uh, the Quran is basically saying that you have to respect the Torah and Nothing the gospel. Nothing there about respect, but... Yeah. Otherwise, you're not going to have it. Right. No, I'm not saying... going to heaven. I'm right. saying that we should actually follow it. Whatever the Torah and the gospel says, we should follow that as well. Which means then, if we read in the gospel, this is the words of Jesus. He says, for even the... Okay, now conveniently he says, this is the words of Jesus. Where is your evidence that this is the words of Jesus? We've already talked about how it's corrupt in the beginning. And you cannot really establish any of this is the words of Jesus, but let's see. Son of man, he's talking about himself being the son of man, came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. No problem. I, I, some people say I've given my life for this work. You know, I'm serving, I'm, I've given my life for this mission. That doesn't mean they literally killed themselves, right? But this is how Christians read because of the bloodthirsty nature of some people. They only look at this and they see blood. But this is a very common expression, but let's continue. So Jesus oh, wow. understood his whole purpose wasn't to be served by the people, but to actually serve them and to give up his life for them. That's correct. Wow. And, wow. And so if the Quran says the gospel is from God and that we should follow what the gospel says, and the gospel says that Jesus did truly die on the cross, then either the Quran is wrong when it says that the gospel is from God, or it's wrong in saying that Jesus didn't die on the cross. Either way, it's a dilemma that... It must be wrong in one of those it's two ways. Dilemma. Or the Bible has been corrupted, as we have already established, and the Quran never told you to follow it. Because all of the verses that you brought are out of context, and it's told you that the Quran is a criterion over them, over these two scriptures, and then they will clarify these points and the changes, like the uh, claim that Jesus died on the cross. So that probably that possibility they look at, but here I'm highlighting. You always see these people, they build false, false premises and then they build arguments upon these false premises. Once you break the false premises, you realize that they, really, they have no argument. Yeah. I, I actually, I wasn't even aware about this, uh, this Quran verse. That's very interesting, Bo. Well, as a Muslim, the next time, uh, if this is true or real, if you're a real person, then you should read the Quran next time, perhaps. At least, at least read the Quran before you engage with the... Uh, a different person about religion, you know, uh, but okay. Right. But I, I knew, I knew for a fact that the Quran definitely mentions the, the respect of the Torah and the gospel, right. of course. That's very, that's very really correct. Yeah. It's a good point. Very good point. <laughs> I like that. Point. Okay. So, uh, it seems like everything the Muslim says in this video is like, yeah, 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 true. Yeah. It makes sense. Makes very good. Interesting. <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll let you guys judge whether this is like a real interaction or not. But anyways, whatever points he raised, we, we've dealt with them. So that doesn't really matter. Do you personally believe that uh, yeah. God started life on Earth? Or do you yeah, think that is intertwined with evolution? It, it was, uh, I... Okay, so apparently, I don't know th what this person is, where this video is from. But this is like, seems like university students asking this individual, do you believe that like uh, about evolution? Do you Muslims believe about evolution, basically? Let's see what this person says completely believe that God started life, but I also completely believe in evolution. Did you know, and this is the issue, like when um, the Christian world was very upset at Darwin's findings, the Muslim world was celebrating. Muslims... No, sorry, what? What? M what Muslims were celebrating for Darwin's theory? Wh which Muslims were celebrating? Which scholars were, were talking about Darwin's theory? Which, which ulama and major scholars were talking about? This is the issue where you have a lot of people but unfortunately, you know, they're too, uh, they're submitting, instead of submitting to their will to Allah, they're submitting to, into the Western man. They're submitting into, uh, quote unquote, the Western, what they would call Western science, you know, and what the Western science says that those people are scientists, they know what they're talking about. And they always have this, this uh, game they play with evolution. They say, all scientists agree. No, not all scientists agree. You know, there's a whole uh, website about a third wave of scientists that disagree, are skeptical. Uh, 1,000 scientists, I believe, that, that wrote, and then there's a specific website about it as well, that wrote their descent towards evolution and how they're skeptical about it. Then you have all of the other scientists, which they will call creationists, and they will kick them out of, from their job because they're opposing evolution and they believe that human beings were created, they did not evolve. And then they will try to tell you that all scientists agree that evolution is true. No, that's not it. You just shame anyone else who disagrees with you, and you just highlight and give Oscars to the one who agree with you. 
Now, and then you get these Muslims, uh, sadly, who try to kind of uh, pretend as if Islam was always with evolution. No, if Islam, there's no, Quran doesn't talk about evolution. And it's explicitly against the idea that, that Adam evolved or the human beings evolved. Adam was directly created by Allah Azza wa There's no such thing as him evolving and human beings evolving from animals and this and that. And if you believe that's a different story, that's not what the Quran says. And that there's no su such thing in the hadith. There's no stories about evolution in the Quran. So uh, to try to pretend that all Muslims are celebrating, that's, that's completely disingenuous. Let's see what else he says. Scholars had been mocked for centuries by Christian scholars for the Quranic belief in evolution. Like, honestly, some people, how can you just make things up like this, you know? You're just making things up. Like, what Muslim scholars have been, been uh, mocked by Christian scholars for believing in evolution? What is this, man? It's very, it's not even ambiguous, right? It's like very specific. Okay, so he's, he's now going to show us the Quran being very specific about evolution, according to him. Now, subhanAllah, and, and uh, for people who like want to uh, talk about evolution and find out my position specifically about evolution, this, the whole video is called uh, uh, Muslims Dismantling uh, Evolution, Theory of Evolution, or Evolution, uh, on my channel, which is like a two-hour monologue where I go and give evidences and establish why it is not uh, something to be believed or taken as, as a reality or a fact. But let's see, now him, he's now apparently going to give us the Quran talking about evolution clearly, not ambiguous, yeah? Let's see. That these are the stages that human beings went through. These are the stages that human beings went through. All the Quran talking about stages that human beings went, went through was that the human beings were, were sperm and then they developed into a mudra and then like a chewed like substance, etc. Alaqa, all of these things, uh, like something that is like a leech. And then the human being is formed and then the bones and, 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 and then the flesh on the bones. This is what the Quran is talking about, which is all about embryology. Or Allah is just speaking about بَدَأَ خَلْقَ الْإِنسَانِ مِنْ طِينَ He started the creation of human beings from a substance like clay, which is a creation of Adam, which has nothing to do with evolution or anything close to it. Then it says ثُمَّ جَعَلَ نَسْلَهُ مِنْ سُلَالَةِ مِنْ مَاءٍ مَهِينَ Then Allah Azzawajal created this progeny from a liquid, right? Liquid like, uh, like which is referring to the, the sperm, etc. So, or the semen. So, this is what the Quran is talking about. What are you talking about? Stages of, of evolution in the Quran. There was, a, uh, there was a point where fire was brooding everything. Fire brooding everything? What is this? And then there was a point where all of life came from water. It was common knowledge. Yeah, okay, the Quran is talking about the, the, the living things are, are made of water. Uh, chapter 21, verse 30, Hay. How is that related to evolution? Like, which evolution is saying that, that like every living thing is made from water? Like, honestly, like... And he's saying not ambiguous, not clear. I don't understand these people who speak about the Quran. Like, I don't know this individual, but this is clearly a bunch of nonsense. And it's sad, yeah, and it's sad to see. And I hope Muslims, they, they don't just bend down to what, what people in the West believe and, oh, they believe it, they accept it, therefore now we have to submit to them. We have our own positions. We know Islam is the truth. We have evidences why the Quran is true. Anything which, is, which would directly oppose, anything which would directly oppose the Quran, we completely reject it. Simple as that. You have to be firm and... and, and, and uh, strong upon your stances as a, as a Muslim. The Holy Quran has said that everything has undergone evolution. <sighs> At this point, I don't know what to say. You know? Except for God. That's what differentiates between the initial cause and the... He's saying the Quran says like, everything has gone under evolution. Everything has gone under evolution. Except There's no such thing in the Quran. And it's just like, how could you just make things up as you go like this? And, and... Allah understand. It's just I hope that Muslims just understand that. Look. You do not need to submit to anyone. You've got the Qur'an and you've got its evidences and this is the truth. Like we don't submit to anyone else's beliefs and what they think is true, what they don't think is true. Yeah, I've shown a video of this guy before, but let's show this one as well. There are three philosophical reasons that I don't trust Muhammad. Okay, so he's now going to give us three, what he refers to as philosophical reasons, or maybe just one in the short, of why he doesn't, he cannot, or he does not trust Prophet Muhammad. Let's see. First point, you will notice that the miracle of Christianity is Jesus Christ. And you don't have to speak a particular language to hear about Jesus. The miracle of Islam is not a person. The miracle of Islam is the book, the Quran. But when you begin to study Islam, what you begin to realize is the only way you can truly appreciate the miracle of Islam is by reading it in Arabic. My philosophical problem with that is why all of a sudden when God reveals himself very wonderfully in an open way in Jesus, does he suddenly say the only way to get my clearest revelation is by learning Arabic? Okay, so, so look at all of these like... Look at all of these, like, I don't know, like straw mans and, and misrepresentations. 
first he says, look, okay, the miracle of, of Islam is not a human being, it's not a person, it is, it is the Quran. Well, first, the main miracle of Islam is the text, is the Quran. But the Prophet ﷺ is also his life is a miracle. He done many miraculous things, miraculous acts that people observe and so. So that is the first misrepresentation that he's putting as pretending as if the Prophet ﷺ is not a significant figure in Islam. And the Quran literally is saying that you have the example to follow in the Prophet ﷺ. And then he says the only way you can appreciate that miracle is through the Arabic language. Okay, then how, can, how do, and he compares it with Jesus being the miracle of Christianity, okay? Then how do you know the miracle of, of Christianity, Jesus? Did you meet Jesus? No, you have to learn English to read an English translation or read Greek or learn Greek to read a Greek translation or Hebrew to read a Hebrew translation. So that is the most ridiculous argument that I've seen. You have to learn a language in the end to learn about whichever figure or whichever book that you want to talk about. This is how information is transmitted. They are transmitted through language, yeah? And language is in a specific language, you know? And then you have to learn that language in order for you to appreciate or learn. But this is not the case even with the Quran. So that's another misrepresentation. It's like you can still appreciate the evidence of Islam and, and the miraculous nature and evidences of its truth without learning the Arabic language. That's why majority, over 80%, 80% or more of the Muslims around the world are non-Arabs. The minority are the Arabs. So how are these 80% of people appreciating? The biggest growing religion in the world is Islam, in the UK and in the USA and everywhere in the Western world. So how are these Westerners appreciating the evidence when they don't speak Arabic? Which shows that you are misrepresenting it intentionally, trying to pretend as if this is the case when it's not. The fact is, whether you can read the translation of the Quran, you can read the translation of the Hadith, and you can still appreciate the miracles of Islam, the miracles of uh, the Quran, without necessarily having to learn the Arabic language. Of course, does the Arabic language give you more knowledge? Yes. Just like Greek will give you more knowledge of the Bible and, will give you, and Hebrew will give you more uh, knowledge and more understanding of the life of Jesus, according to your accounts, which we don't trust. So either way, you need a language. So that is a very, like, it's a very weak argument that, that I've, I see often presented. It's were sent to all the nations in the world to spread the word of Islam. It says that in the Quran. Another thing, the Quran is... Yes, she's right. The Quran says that this message is for everyone. Uh, and Allah says to Prophet Muhammad to say, Ya uh, Nasu inni Rasulullah ilaykum jami'a, O mankind and the Messenger of God to all of you. It's not the word of Muhammad, it is the word of God. Hey. Yes, and she's correcting him. The Quran is not uh, the word of Prophet Muhammad, it's the word of God. So what you're appreciating there is the word of God. What you're looking at, the miraculous nature, is the word of the Creator. And if the Creator wants to communicate with you, with humans, then you have Allah or the Creator, will communicate with us through language. This is how we communicate, you know? So it has to be in a specific language in the end. Thank you. It's the word of God, that's right. But it was written by Muhammad. It was not written by Muhammad. And this person doesn't even know when he's talking about Islam and philosophical issues. And he doesn't even know <laughs> whether the Quran is written by Prophet Muhammad or not. Which is like surprising. Honestly. Prophet he could not read or write. As well as many of the people, majority of the people at that time. In Mecca and the deserts of Arabia could not read or write. A minority were, were the literate people. But the Prophet had writers of revelations. People who were called Katabat al Wahi. And he, he used to call them to write revelation whenever revelation was revealed. But it, it's mainly an oral text, so he memorized it and recited it, and the people memorized it. Who wrote it? Muhammad was illiterate. He didn't know how to write or read. Who wrote it? It was the word of God. Like, what is this like? <laughs> who wrote it? Okay, I, I told you a few minutes ago, if you watch this video, maybe. It's divine word. You see? Every single time, they're very consistent. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. We are consistent as Muslims, uh, which is something that sadly you don't see with, with a lot of Christians, but we do appreciate the compliment. It's, there's a very popular narration that is mentioned in this hadith, and I think it's misunderstood a lot. Some person sent me this video, which uh, I want to comment on and highlight a few things, inshallah. So let's see. <laughs> I know people from my ummah, from the Muslims. يأتون يوم القيامة بحسنات أمثال جبال تهامة بيضاء. They will come in the day of judgment with good deeds the size of. Okay, so so it says that there will be people who will come on the on the day of judgment with the size of mountains. Uh, okay. Mountains glowing bright. So the Rasul says, فيجعله الله هباء منثورا. And yet Allah رب العزة والملك تسبيه like husks of. Okay, so these deeds of these specific individuals will, will be made to disappear, right? So they will be do, doing good deeds, righteous deeds, actions, this and that. So why will all of these deeds uh, disappear? You know, it just blows away in the wind. 
all their deeds will disappear. So the Sahabi asks, Ya Rasul, describe them to us so we don't do what they do. So the Rasul said, Okay, so they ask now the description of who, who these people are. They are from your brothers, and from your tribesmen, and they're not ordinary Muslims. They are people who wake up in the middle of the night and pray as you pray. But what is the problem? Okay, so they are people who are among the Muslims, and, and they pray in the night and they do these specific things, okay. But they are people when in seclusion they transgress against the limits of Allah. Okay, so that when they're alone, they commit sins, they commit mistakes, okay? Think Muslim when he and she is alone in a room and there's a screen and a laptop and a computer and a phone, they transgress against the limits and boundaries of Allah. The poem says it beautifully. Okay, so, so now it's talking about what? People who uh, are from amongst this ummah, and then when it comes to the ummah, uh, you have two types of, of the ummah. The people who, uh, the ummah of istijaba and ummah of the da'wah. Ummah can be everyone, literally, that the Prophet ﷺ calls to Islam, the Muslim and the non-Muslim. But the ummah of the Prophet means the people who he was sent to since his message started. And then you have the ummah of, of ijaba, the people who accepted the message, right? So this hadith just says ummah. And then it says these people do a lot of righteous deeds, good deeds, and, and then like the mountains. Good righteous deeds like the mountains. But Allah Azza wa Jal, He causes these, all of these good deeds to disappear on the Day of Judgment. Why? Why is mentioned in the Hadith? The reason is that they do specific sins in secret. Whenever, whenever they are alone, secluded, every time, and this is, this is the best translation now, every time they are in seclusion uh, or hidden in a hidden specific place that no one is around them, they are with Allah Azza wa Jal is the only one who sees them. They break the, the commands of Allah Azza wa Jal. So, إِذَا خَلَوْ That means every time. This is a better translation of uh, the hadith. Now, there's a few issues now. The first thing is that this hadith, first is disagreed upon its authenticity. The hadith is degree, disagreed upon its authenticity. And, and there is a, a person in, in the chain of narration. He's an individual that there is a disagreement when it comes to, to, to his strength in narration. So there is a disagreement when it comes to the authenticity of this specific narration. That's the first thing now. But let's say assuming we take the, the authenticity of the narration and we take the people who authenticated this narration. Now there's a very uh, problematic things to take. First is, okay, if you are alone, you do, you do the sin in, in secret. It, the, the default position in Islam is that you're supposed to be doing the sins in secret. You're not supposed to be publicly doing them and sharing them with the people. Why? Because the Prophet ﷺ said, Every person of my nation, he will be pardoned except those who expose and do their sins out there publicly for other people to see. Because when you do it publicly, then people see and then the, the sin does not become, uh, it becomes normalized and then other people are doing it and then it becomes easier for people to do. So it's a lot more egregious for someone to be committing sins publicly. So it is absolutely better from an Islamic point of view that you keep the sins that you do between you and Allah. So do not take this misunder do not listen to this narration and then get a misunderstanding for it because this is not the case. In fact, there, there is uh, in the tafsir of the verse of the Quran that, that he will be having an easy uh, hisab when Allah Azza wa Jal uh, holds him accountable on the day of judgment for his deeds. There is a hadith which is explaining that the person who he hid the sins that he did. So then Allah Azza wa Jal says that you hid them and kept them in secret. So today I'll forgive them. No one else knows about them. You kept them hid, hidden and secret. And then Allah forgives them for, the, for uh, not exposing them. So as a Muslim, you shouldn't be exposing them. But in the same time, you shouldn't be thinking that it's okay now when you're alone, you do things and you don't fear Allah Azza wa You should always keep in mind that Allah Azza wa is watching. Uh, because Allah says in the Quran about the hypocrites, the munafiqun, which we're going to hi highlight in a second now. That, uh, min nasi wa la min Allah. They hide from the people, they don't hide from Allah Azza wa and he's with them when they're in, at the night, right? So uh, you have to be as a Muslim. In the same time, while you are hiding the, the shortcomings that you have, you shouldn't be thinking that it's okay, it's normal now, only Allah sees me, so I'm going to do it. You should always have in mind that Allah sees you, and that should prevent you as much as possible from uh, committing certain things, committing certain sins and, and, and certain bad acts. But this narration here is to be understood to be talking about the hypocrites. Yes, the hypocrites were among the companions. They used to pray. And they used to do all of these different things. But those are the people 
that Allah Azza wa Jal causes their deeds to go to waste. Allah Azza wa Jal says in the Quran, We came to the deeds that they, that they do, and then we made them disappear. So this is referring to these believers. So this hadith here is referring to the munafiqeen, the hypocrites, those who were doing major nifaq. They were among the companions. Yeah, they were around them, claiming to be their brothers. They were praying and doing everything. But every time, خلو, that means خلو, every time they go and they are in secret, they, they mock the religion. They mock Allah Azza wa Jalla. Like Allah Azza wa Jalla says in Surah Al-Baqarah. He says, وَإِذَا لَقُوا الَّذِينَ أَمَنُوا قَالُوا أَمَنَا If they see those who, if they see the believers, they say we believe. And then if they, وَإِذَا خَلَوْا إِلَى شَيَاطِينِهِمْ If they go to now their, their shayateen, their other uh, disbelievers, they mock. They say we are actually with you, O uh, shayateen. We are only mocking the believers. So this hadith is to be understood about if it's authentic. If you're going to take its authenticity, then as a Muslim, you should understand this hadith is referring to the munafiqun, the people who are hypocrites, major nifaq, who show belief and then uh, hide disbelief in their hearts. But the Muslims, their deeds are not just uh, gone to waste fully like this. Because as a Muslim, you're supposed to hide the shortcomings that you have. This is the default position. This is what you're supposed to do. So, uh, yeah, so the people, yeah, a lot of people use this hadith regarding what certain people do, you know, you know, a, a major disease that is spread in the Muslim community to do with, like, for, for example, pornographic materials and this and that. You know, a lot of people, they do these things in secret. And a lot of the people try to use this hadith in that way to, to make these people afraid. Yes, there are many other things that you can use. Like Allah Azza wa Jal, he says in the Quran, uh, that the believers, uh, that they are preserving the private parts where Allah Azza wa Jal says in the Quran. You should lower your gaze. All of these things that you should use uh, evidence rather than using a misunderstanding perhaps of the hadith and making people scared in a way uh, that may make them despair from the mercy of Allah Azza wa Jal thinking that you know what all their deeds are now wasted because of this specific thing. But yeah, this kind of pornographic things, it is absolutely a disease that Muslims need to look out for. You know, and we are uh, at Ramadan right now. It is a perfect chance and opportunity for people to try their best uh, to seek forgiveness uh, from Allah Azza wa Jal and get away of all of these like filthy habits, which are, trust me, are only going to destroy you as an individual in the long term and in the short term. So try your best, inshallah. The best way to, to leave it, do not stay alone most of the time. Stay around other people. Keep yourself busy. This is the most important thing. Keep yourself busy. Go into the gym, working, doing something. You have to keep yourself busy. Fasting, the advice of the Prophet ﷺ, getting married, absolutely, trying your best to get married. All of these are ways to try to get away from it, but most importantly is dua. Asking Allah uh, to, to save you from these type of evil acts and evil deeds that are done, and to keep you away from them and to completely purify your heart. And keep yourself with a good uh, company of Muslims. Keep yourself around good people. But this hadith uh, needs to be, uh, be understood in, in the right way. So I hope that clarifies it a bit. If we are going to accept this authenticity, because as I said, there's also a disagreement anyways. But if we will accept the hadith uh, to be authentic, then this is the correct understanding uh, to look at. Uh, because the default position is that you should hide uh, your shortcomings as a Muslim.